everyone. I'm Tanya Rivero. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi announced a formal impeachment inquiry into President Trump Tuesday. The decision to launch an inquiry comes after months of caution by Pelosi. She said a whistleblower complaint about President Trump became a tipping point. This week, the president has admitted to asking the president of Ukraine to take actions which would benefit him politically. The, action of the, Trump, the actions of the Trump presidency revealed a dishonorable fact of the president's betrayal of his oath of office, betrayal of our national security, and betrayal of the integrity of our elections. Therefore, today, I'm announcing the House of Representatives moving forward with an official impeachment inquiry. The House Speaker is referring to a whistleblower complaint that brought intense scrutiny to a call the president made with his Ukrainian counterpart. It involves concerns Mr. Trump may have made an improper promise during that conversation. We will soon know more about what was said because the president says he'll release a transcript of it. The president's call coincided with a delay in military aid to Ukraine. Mr. Trump says the funds were withheld because he wanted other nations to contribute to Ukraine. Today, he denied claims it was done to pressure Ukraine to investigate the Biden family. That call was perfect. It couldn't have been nicer. And even the Ukrainian government put out a statement that that was a perfect call. There was no pressure put on them whatsoever. But there was pressure put on with respect to Joe Biden. What Joe Biden did for his son, that's something they should be looking at. Mr. Trump is accusing the former vice president of improperly assisting his son, Hunter Biden. He used to be on the board of a Ukrainian gas company. No evidence has surfaced to support Mr. Trump's claims. The transcript of the call is expected to be released as early as Wednesday. It is the same day Mr. Trump will meet with the Ukrainian president at the United Nations. The acting director of national intelligence is expected to testify Thursday about the whistleblower complaint. The House Intelligence Committee chairman says he could bring the whistleblower directly to Capitol Hill as soon as this week. And here is how Republican leadership responded to Pelosi's announcement she is launching the inquiry. She cannot unilaterally decide we're in an impeachment inquiry. What she said today made no difference of what's been going on. It's no different than what Nadler's been trying to do. It's time to put the public before politics. We're now going to bring in our panel, Major Garrett, Molly Hooper, and Keir Dougal. Thanks to all of you for being with us. Major Garrett is the Chief Washington Correspondent for CBS News. Molly is a CBSN political contributor, and Keir Dougal is with me here on set. He's a CBSN legal contributor and former assistant U.S. attorney for New York's Eastern District. Major, let me start with you. Now that we know that there will be a formal impeachment inquiry, can you lay out for us exactly how the impeachment process works? Well, as Speaker Pelosi just said, the six committees already investigating matters that they believe might constitute high crimes and misdemeanors. Remember, that's the constitutional standard for impeachment. will continue their work under the umbrella of an impeachment inquiry. Now, if Congress decides to hatch, actually have a vote to place that official umbrella term legislatively over those six committees that will invest the House majority with more power to carry out some of the legal wrangling it's carried out with this administration. In other words, enforcing subpoenas that the administration has ignored or fought in court. But essentially what the speaker has laid out is a process that goes forward largely as it has been going on so far with this one added detail, which she mentioned and referred to repeatedly in her prepared remarks, that this particular newest encounter of the House Democrats with this administration over the Director of National Intelligence Inspector General's refusal to provide the whistleblower account to Congress is, in the Speaker's words, a violation of law. And that lawlessness, she said, is what is now brought this to a tipping point and change the underlying politics in the House Democratic Congress caucus writ large and most specifically change the politics for the speaker who has been, if anything, a publicly reluctant voice along the road of impeachment inquiry. She is no longer reluctant. She's now putting the full weight of the speakership behind that. And it is worth pointing out, writ large, the entire Democratic Party. Right. All right, Kira, I want to turn to you now. 
if we can talk about what constitutes an impeachable offense as relates to this phone call. It seems to me there are two two things that are being investigated. Number one, whether there was a quid pro quo, which is something the president denies there was. Number two, whether he was asking a foreign leader to investigate a political rival, which is something the president actually admits to doing. He says there was a reason for that, but he admits to doing that. Which of those two things is worse in the eyes of the law? So the Constitution talks about treason, bribery, and high crimes and misdemeanors as what is an impeachable offense for which the president can be removed from office. The phrase high crimes and misdemeanors we've all heard before, um, and it is uh, something with a very broad definition. It's really imported from English common law by the founders at the time that the uh, Constitution was adopted. And what that really means at the core of it, it means abuse of office in a way that hurts the public. Mm -hmm. And so um, the question really becomes, I think, in these circumstances, is the president using his office for personal political gain in an, in an improper and corrupt way? And so the, the notion uh, that um, and Nancy Pelosi just mentioned it, the, the notion that the president would seek um, assistance from a foreign nation to get himself reelected is very problematic. Um, the, the Constitution and the, the, the removal provisions in the Constitution, they're sort of quasi-political and quasi-legal. So when we talk about a quid pro quo, you're, you're, you're sort of leading into questions about a bribery. And um, as, as I, I think we've seen with the Mueller investigation, the framers didn't necessarily make an impeachable offense something that depended on a, on a crime, on mm -hmm. the existence of a crime. It's a political offense. Um, and, and for some of this conduct, I think it would be very difficult, or there may be uh, defenses to trying to fit President Trump's conduct into either an extortion or a bribery or a campaign finance right. violation. But really, it's a political question. All right, I just want to interrupt for a second to point out that the president has tweeted, not surprisingly, in response to Nancy Pelosi. He is here in New York at the U.N., and he tweeted saying, such an important day at the United Nations, so much work and so much success, and the Democrats purposely had to ruin and demean it with more breaking news witch hunt garbage. So bad for our country. I suppose uh, not surprising that he would have a rapid Twitter response. So... No president has ever been removed through impeachment. Molly, what do you expect to happen next? Well, the, what's going to happen next is a little unclear, given that traditionally the House Judiciary Committee takes up the, um, the, the impeachment inquiry, so to speak, and conducts, invest, you know, conducts the investigation, subpoenas witnesses, holds hearings, and then marks up, essentially, the charges, the articles of impeachment that then are referred back or recommended back to the House floor, after which the House would vote on each individual article of impeachment, essentially a charge. What, what the individual's charged with. And, and given that Pelosi is saying that all six committees are going to continue down the same path that they're on, essentially, it's really unclear how they're going to conduct or, or move forward with impeachable offenses or, or articles of impeachment, which is ultimately what, what an impeachment inquiry culminates in. And so, and so I think that there will be, um, and from what I understand among Democrats, is there's a bit of a turf war, because House Judiciary Committee, like I said, traditionally has taken this role, the lead in the past. But there's been some disagreement between the way that Jerry Nadler, is the chairman of the Judiciary Committee, has handled um, impeachment-related hearings, like the one last week with Corey Lewandowski, and the way that um, Nancy Pelosi would have liked to, that to have gone. And so, again, I think that those committee chairs are going to look for a little bit more direction. But as to the timeline and when we would see articles of impeachment, it's just unclear. Major, I want to ask you, uh, according to the president, the transcript of the call will be released tomorrow. Right. Uh, what can we expect to come out of that? And what kind of defense <laughs> can we expect the president to mount? Okay, that's very tricky territory in the what can we expect <laughs> world, because I've never witnessed that before. I mean, we say this with some frequency, and just because we say it with some frequency doesn't mean it's true and doesn't mean we ought not to pause and say to ourselves and take maybe kind of a slightly deep breath and say, we really haven't seen this before. So we have an allegation before the entire country that a president of the United States might have used 
the strong arm of the American presidency to gather potentially helpful political dirt on an emerging political rival with a foreign country. That's a pretty heavy accusation. Then we have the president say, no, I didn't do any of those things. You're all jumping to conclusions. You're all believing the worst about me. And to prove it, I'm going to give you a transcript of my private conversation with a newly elected foreign leader. I know of no modern precedent for either the accusation or the transcript emerging in public. So when you say, what should we expect? I don't have the foggiest <laughs> idea what we should expect, except what may be the president has indicated a conversation full of praiseworthy comments from the president, receiving them in a praiseworthy fashion from the Ukrainian president, newly elected, and mm -hmm. then a lot of things that people on both sides of the aisle may read differently. I think it's important today, just hours before this conversation and her appearance before the cameras, Nancy Pelosi said, and we ran the soundbite briefly, there doesn't need to be an obvious quid pro quo in that phone mm -hmm, right. conversation transcript mm -hmm. for this to be a transgression of our institutional understanding of the powers of the presidency and how they should be used. Mm -hmm. That's her conclusion. I am relatively confident most Republicans are yet to embrace that conclusion. They may look at the transcript and says, looks fine to me, says what the president said. This is just another democratic overreaction, a politicization of the process of what this president is or what he has been or what he's alleged to, do have, to have done, and they may leave it alone. Until we see the transcript, we can't know. But that the president is releasing it and has ignored some of his advisors who said, look, whatever the contents of that call, Mr. President, however honest you think it makes you look, it's a bad precedent mm -hmm. for the institution of the presidency, and you ought not to do it. Right. Well, it's clear this president is not as interested in the precedence of the presidency as he is in his own narrative, and he's going to advance his narrative as he's described it tomorrow. And you know, one thing that we can't lose sight of, and I'm sure that no lawmakers are losing sight of, is regardless of what the president did or didn't do, regardless of whether or not he, you know, violated his office, this is a political process and it comes down to votes, essentially. So let's discuss the lawmakers we know who have come out in support of impeachment. By our account, at least 170 Democrats are in favor of an inquiry opening. So, Molly, is this a make or break issue for Democratic lawmakers, especially those moderates who've stayed out of the impeachment fray thus far? Well, I think what we need to do is look to those seven House Democrats, the freshmen who won in Trump majority districts this last election in 2018, who wrote an op ed that was published in The Washington Post today. These Democrats, Allison Spanberger, former CIA analyst, Alyssa Slotkin, same thing, former CIA, and we have military veterans who, who also joined on this. And they were particularly concerned about the Ukraine call and, again, the perception and, and the appearance of abuse of power. Going to Major's point, the president using his, the strong, you know, the, this sort of strong arming another country by using the fact that he's the president of the United States. You don't necessarily need to explicitly ask for, you know, a quid pro quo, but the fact that say I'm the president of the United States and I'm calling and saying, hey. We have this military aid for you, but, um, you know, how, how's, how's that inquiry into Joe Biden going? And, you know, f for, for the, co the other country to pick up what he's putting down, if you know what I'm saying. And, and those Democrats, those moderates, are particularly concerned by that abuse of power. And, again, I think that there needs to be a little bit more clarity in how these six committees are going to proceed, because, again, just because they're, they're investigating and holding hearings, we don't know what the specific charges are that would come to the House floor. And each and the members will vote on those each specific charge. One may be related to obstruction of justice. The other may be related to um, this Ukrainian phone call. It really depends. And I think that you'll see more Democrats um, in favor of an article of impeachment that is related to this, percep this perceived abuse of power on the Ukrainian issue. All right, Molly Hooper, thank you so much for that. We thank know you. you have to dash, so thank you for joining us. We'll, <laughs> we'll let you go now. Um, Major, I'm going to turn to you now. Will this be a test of Republicans at this point, those who will support the president through thick or thin, or those who may see the writing on the wall? It is a test, and so far I detect no particular wobbling among House or Senate Republicans. There might have been some 
detectable at the very, very thinnest margins when the Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell today did not offer any stout defense of the president, but only said in questioning put to him by our colleague Nancy Cordes that he inquired several times about this Ukrainian assistance passed by Congress, signed by the president, that was being held up for what he described as unknown reasons. He kept asking, why is this aid, this lethal military aid, being held up? And he never got a response. That's all he would say today. Mm -hmm. He didn't condemn the president, but he didn't suggest there was nothing there there, and this was a matter that had been resolved to his satisfaction. Is that an insight into some level of discomfort that the Senate Majority Leader may possess? Could that be reflective of discomfort that Republicans are feeling but not yet publicly expressing? I would only say about that, stay tuned. Mm -hmm. One thing I would observe, with this release of the transcript tomorrow, there will be a, I guarantee you, declaration from the White House of maximum transparency. But really, that's not at the heart of this matter. What's at the heart of this matter, and what the Speaker of the House just referred to, is the whistleblower account mm -hmm. and the Inspector General's summary thereof. And we have been told, and reporting on this suggests, that that whistleblower and the Inspector General looking at that information saying, this looks very serious to me and falls within the ambit of the law, which means I need to do something with it, was not only about Ukraine, but other matters as well. So, will that ever surface? And if it doesn't surface, you might have the White House saying, hey, we were transparent on the thing you were all concerned about, but we're not on the other thing. But well, the other thing might be the real matter. Good point, uh, though, Major, to follow up on that. There were leaks, right? We sort of learned more and more about this Ukraine call through some leaks. So is it possible that we can learn more about what you just brought up through some it, leaks? <laughs> hope springs eternal on the leak front, I will tell you that, uh, and always has here in Washington and always will. Uh, and that is something that we have been notified again, because this happens so often in our current atmosphere on Twitter, not any other way, but the House Intelligence Committee Chairman Adam Schiff said it appears that this whistleblower is moving closer toward a testimony of some kind. The Senate mm -hmm. Intelligence Committee, on a bipartisan basis, is moving toward getting to these underlying facts of what alarmed the whistleblower in the first place. And what the inspector general thought was, if not equally alarming, sufficiently alarming to raise concerns. Let me ask you Once something, Once we get Major, to those underlying details, we may know about war, about, importantly, what this is and what it isn't. But what's to stop this whistleblower from going to Congress himself, defying the, the director of national intelligence and just saying, I feel so strongly about this information, I'm releasing it to Congress regardless of, you know, my superiors? Every, every whistleblower... Once, if there's a process, to follow the process of the law. Why? To avoid the accusation that you're a whistleblower in essentially partisan clothing, and that's why you're motivated. You're not whistleblowing to save the country or to live up to the law. You're just ratting somebody out because you've got a policy disagreement or a partisan disagreement. So whistleblowers, the general tendency is, and certainly if they ever obtain legal counsel, the legal counsel is always the same. Follow the process. Trust in the process and follow it. And that's what we are led to believe the whistleblower has done. Moving outside of that process invites all sorts of other criticism that at this moment, and I'm not predicting anything going forward, but at this moment, the whistleblower, whoever he or she is, is not comfortable with. So, Keir, speaking from a legal perspective, is that correct? The whistleblower should just hold tight and wait and see where the process takes he or she. Well, uh, Major is certainly correct that, that holding tight um, will provide the whistleblower with the maximum amount of protection. If you step outside that process, you're potentially violating the secrecy mm -hmm. laws. Um, you potentially could lose your job. Um, these things are important to th th this individual, he or she, whoever uh, they may be. So uh, to the extent that they can put together a process that's within the guardrails, they're certainly going to want to try to do that. Um, just to follow up on what Major said earlier, though, about the transparency, one thing that I would want to keep my eye on is this transcript that we're hearing described. Theoretically, that's being that's a, a written um, summary of something else. And so the question that I have is, is there a tape? Do the Ukrainians have a tape of uh. this conversation? Does the White House have a tape of this conversation? In other words, the mention that happened eight times may not happen eight times in the transcript. 
Correct. Uh, there, or the, there, that allegedly happened eight times. There are a couple of issues. As a former prosecutor, I can tell you a couple of issues. I don't want the transcript. Mm -hmm. I want the recording. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I want the recording is because of all the nuance, mm -hmm. all the, uh, the inflection, pauses, the, the pauses. Inflections. Mm -hmm. Is it is somebody yelling? Is somebody being sarcastic? Molly got at it. Is you know? Is it is it uh, an under understanding that's, that you can get, gather from from the recording that you can't get from the flat text? And so. Uh, you know, when Major talked about transparency, um, I would really, if I was going to claim transparency, mm -hmm. I would want to release all of this stuff. And finally, good point, though. Major, has there been any movement to actually hear the tapes? Has anyone asked for the tapes themselves? Well, that's why I'm glad we have a prosecutor on set with us today, because that's something I hadn't thought of. That that is even better. Mm -hmm. And. To the degree I have gotten to know the way that Donald Trump operates, both as a candidate and as a president, I do know this. He loves the telephone. He uses the telephone as a way of taking the measure of the person he's talking to. And to the point that was just made, he raises and lowers his voice, moves in with intensity, backs off, all to take not just the measure of the moment, but the person who he's dealing with. And trying to figure out in intuitive ways and in maybe double speak ways what he's driving at and what he may be able to expect in a reciprocal response. Those kinds of things would be much more evident, I believe, in a recording than a transcript. So the president did not say recording. He said transcript, declassified transcript, not a recording. But I think the point is incredibly well taken that listening to it would be much better and more revealing and more clarifying than reading it. Right. All right. So, Kira, another question I want to ask you, though, legally, is this question of withholding U.S. aid, which we found out happened about a week or so before this phone call took place. The president said it had nothing to do with anything other than the fact that he was uncomfortable with the U.S. alone giving the Ukraine so much aid and wanted more money to come from other parties, Europe or whatnot. At the end of the day, would his motivation for withholding that aid matter? Well, this comes back to whether or not you want to look at this alleged uh, conduct. It's all alleged, as Major says, and as I think we need to remember of right course. now. Yeah. It's all alleged, but it comes back to whether you want to analyze it in political terms or in criminal terms. So if you analyze it in criminal terms, uh, the state of mind does matter. Uh, is there an innocent state of mind about whether or not you simply wanted to prompt your allies to uh, pony up more? or whether you're using it as a cudgel to have uh, the Ukraine help you in your reelection effort. That state of mind would matter very much in a criminal case. In a political sense, is the president using the massive powers of the presidency to aid himself in a corrupt way? Um, that is a different set of questions that I think the Congress would be investigating and the Senate would have to consider in an impeachment trial. So if you were... If you were investigating this, there's just no way of finding out exactly what someone's state of mind is, correct? Well, you, you do, you, we don't have an MRI, a, a machine that can look into somebody's mind and, and uh, tell us what they were thinking uh, weeks or months ago. We don't have that. But prosecutors, um, meat and potatoes work day in and day out is listening to things if they exist, like the ta uh, tape recording, if it exists that will be very powerful evidence. You look at the circumstances, you look at the other communications, you talk to the people around the president, what was the advice, did he accept it, did he reject mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. what were people's reactions. Um, you can put together an in, a, a case based on intent through circumstantial evidence, that's typically the way prosecutors do it. So you can piece together an idea of what the intent probably was. Yes. Let's remind ourselves of something that happened in broad daylight and is part of, I have to acknowledge another network's archive of news information regarding President Trump. ABC News was in the Oval Office in the person of George Stephanopoulos, and George Stephanopoulos stood right next to the President of the United States, Donald Trump, sitting at the Resolute desk and asked him, point blank, if a foreign government offered you dirt on a political opponent, would you take it? Do we remember what the president said? He said yes. Mm -hmm out loud, on camera, 
And he also said, I don't think there'd be anything wrong with it. Why wouldn't I take it? It's not like I would be doing anything wrong. If it was offered, I might take it. I just very well might. So, Major... Now, I'm not inventing that. That's what the President of the United States said. And I would say, in that context, you have to ask yourself, well, in this conversation, do those things matter? Are they contextual to either the President's desires, motives, right. or inklings? We, that happened in public not too long ago. Right. So, uh... He wasn't I'm lying. Just he wasn't <laughs> lying there, it appears. All right. Well, Major Garrett and Keir Dougal, thanks to both of you so much. You got it. Thank you.